Hello, and welcome to this event on multimodal signal processing and learning for wearables. Some housekeeping as we begin. Firstly, please do stay on mute whilst in the main meeting, although when we reach the group work, please do unmute when in the breakout rooms. Secondly, do use the chat to pass on any questions, comments, criticisms or compliments. Cardiovascular disease accounts for over a quarter of deaths in the UK. During this talk it will cause three hospital admissions, five deaths and result in £250,000 of healthcare costs. The widespread use of wearables provides opportunity to assess cardiovascular health in daily life and potentially reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease. Wearables such as this fitness tracker provide a wealth of information on the heart, blood vessels, cardiovascular health and other aspects of health and fitness. Potentially, wearables could be used to identify a wide range of diseases including cardiovascular diseases and other diseases, potentially identifying them earlier than in current clinical practice and helping users to manage their health. To introduce myself, my name's Peter Charlton and I'm a researcher at the University of Cambridge and at City University of London. I work alongside clinical colleagues such as at St Thomas's Hospital shown here to develop signal processing techniques for wearables which could be used for clinical decision making. Recently, I've been working on developing data analysis techniques for use with wearables in daily life. Through my work, I aim to make devices as accurate as possible, unlike the fictional heart rate of 119 beats per minute shown here. To give you an outline of this workshop, our aim is to gain knowledge and skills to apply best practices to process wearable data. Now this is a fairly bold aim and I don't claim that we will manage this in this workshop alone, but I hope that it will be a starting point and give you um, some fundamental knowledge and skills on which you can build. I hope that this workshop will benefit researchers, device designers, clinicians and ultimately the millions of people who use wearables to monitor their health and fitness. Our learning objectives are firstly to understand the background to wearables, the signals they acquire, the underlying physiology and potential applications. Secondly to learn fundamental techniques for processing wearable signals. And thirdly, to gain hands-on experience of signal processing and machine learning with wearable data. On the right you can see uh, the schedule for the workshop uh, consisting of firstly in the next 15 minutes I'll provide an introduction to wearables, then we'll have some interactive tutorials on fundamental techniques for processing wearable signals, and then we'll have a case study which will provide hands-on experience of signal processing and machine learning in groups. I'd like to thank my fellow organisers Kelly, Elisa, Serena and Martin. Thank you all for your contributions and I'm sure you will see them over the next couple of hours. So to provide the background to wearables I'll give an overview of wearable devices, the signals they acquire, the physiology behind the signals and potential clinical applications. So, wearable devices. Wearable devices have potential to transform physiological measurement. Traditionally, physiological measurements such as an ECG or blood pressure measurement are taken in healthcare settings using uh, relatively bulky equipment by trained operators. 
In contrast, wearables could provide unobtrusive health monitoring in daily life without the need to go to a healthcare setting, without the constraints of a bulky device and without the need for a trained operator. Wearables now come in a range of form factors and it's reasonable to assume that not only could they be worn unobtrusively but also to some extent at least they're inexpensive. So if you search, uh, most recently I found that you could purchase a wearable that claimed to tell you your blood pressure for under five dollars. Now I wouldn't necessarily suggest spending less than five dollars on a wearable but it just demonstrates uh, that potentially in the future these may be widely accessible. Finally, wearables such as these provide the user with opportunity to take ownership over their health and to make lifestyle changes in response to the data collected. So let's now look at the signals that these devices measure. And we'll focus on three key signals. Firstly, accelerometry. Accelerometers measure acceleration. And they do so typically in three directions, X, Y, and Z, three perpendicular directions. Shown on the left is a plot of these three accelerometry signals gathered by a device. And you can see that the lowest signal has a greater amplitude than the others. And in this case, that's because this subject was walking so you can see in this signal there's a uh, periodic variation every second or so representing each step. And note also that this one is offset by approximately minus 10 meters per second squared, indicating that this is dominated by the acceleration due to gravity. So this corresponds to the downwards direction. We can combine these three into one resultant accelerometer signal shown on the right. And this can be helpful because the mean deviation of this signal around that mean value, so how much it varies around that 10 meters per second squared, helps identify the intensity of physical activity. So it can be used to classify activities as sedentary, light walking, brisk walking, and uh, jogging or running. So the accelerometry signal, widely used in wearables, uh, inexpensive, low power consumption, a helpful sensor and signal. Secondly, the electrocardiogram or ECG can now be measured at the wrist using a consumer device by placing the opposite hand on the device so that one electrode is in contact with the wrist on which the device is worn and then the opposite hand touches another electrode providing the equivalent of a lead one ECG as shown on the right. And for us today the key aspect here is the R waves which indicate heart beats. These are the sharp spikes in the signal. And I'll spend a little more time on the photoplethysmogram, or PPG for short. If you have a fitness tracker or smartwatch, you may have seen sensors on its underside, perhaps emitting red or green light. These are PPG sensors. I'll use a cross-section of the wrist to illustrate how a PPG signal is generated and captured. In this example, a green LED is used to illuminate the wrist. Some of the light is attenuated in the tissues and some is reflected back towards the sensor. The level of reflected light is recorded by a light sensor in yellow. Here is an example of the resulting PPG signal. You can see there's uh, one cycle per heartbeat. In this example, the heart rate is slower.
Besides the heart rate, the PPG signal can also be used to assess heart rhythm, since an irregular rhythm such as atrial fibrillation, shown here, results in both irregular beat-to-beat -beat intervals and varying pulse amplitudes. Focusing in on a single pulse wave, the shape of an individual pulse wave generated by one heartbeat contains many features which are determined primarily by the heart and blood vessels. These can tell us a lot about cardiovascular health. So if you compare the shape of pulse waves between healthy young and healthy, healthy elderly subjects, you'll see marked differences, such as the disappearance of this second peak in the signal. The shape is influenced by many cardiovascular properties, as shown for eight different properties here. And this presents a challenge when we're analysing this data, because to assess one parameter on its own, such as blood pressure, we have to make sure that any measurements we are taking are not confounded by the other properties. For further information on photoplethysmography, I'd refer you to these publications. So, briefly, the underpinning physiology. And here I'll focus on estimating blood pressure from the PPG and the ECG. As blood pressure increases, the arteries expand and their stiffness increases as they are stretched. And this results in an increased speed of pulse wave propagation from the heart to the periphery, so an increased pulse wave velocity. And it's this increase in pulse wave velocity that occurs with increases in blood pressure that allows us to assess blood pressure from these signals. So in a first approach, we can take a single PPG pulse wave and extract a feature such as this time delay, which changes with blood pressure. And then uh, below this picture, you can see we can formulate a relationship between here the systolic blood pressure and this feature. Ideally, we might want two pulse waves to measure the pulse transit time, the time delay between the pulse close to the heart and further away from the heart. Um, and then we can similarly form a relationship between blood pressure and this parameter. However, usually wearables don't afford this luxury where we can have PPG measurements both close to the heart and further away. So instead, the ECG provides an alternative where we can measure the pulse arrival time, the time from the R wave of the ECG indicating the electrical activity of uh, the heart contracting, and then the arrival of the pulse wave at the periphery, such as the finger shown here. Finally, clinical applications. Here are a few select applications. Firstly, atrial fibrillation. It's thought that if atrial fibrillation was adequately treated in England, 2,000 lives would be saved per year, 7,000 strokes would be prevented each year, and 425,000 additional diagnoses would be made. Atrial fibrillation is the most common abnormal heart rhythm and it increases risk of stroke by fivefold. However, it's not always symptomatic and it can occur only intermittently, making it difficult to identify in um, routine practice. A wearable provides opportunity to monitor the heart rhythm almost continuously in daily life and so pick up the irregular beat-to-beat -beat intervals which are caused by atrial fibrillation even if they don't occur very often. That's the theory at least. So one promising application. Other potential applications involve identifying obstructive sleep apnea, that's when 
breathing ceases during sleep just for a short time and here a great advance has been the inclusion of oxygen saturation monitoring in wearables which would be very helpful for detecting the desaturations that occur when breathing stops in sleep and helping to identify this disease which similarly to atrial fibrillation is under diagnosed. And thirdly, perhaps an application for the future, detecting infectious diseases and monitoring their spread. It's been shown to be potentially possible with influenza-like illnesses, looking at heart rate and sleep, and also in COVID-19 as well. For further information on these and a wide range of other clinical applications, I'd refer you to these publications. So, may I conclude by extending a warm welcome from myself to this event. For the remainder of the event, we will be focusing on the resources available at this address here. So, please do uh, enter this link in your browser and we'll now carry on referring to these resources. Thank you.